of months ago, as I was on my way to work, I saw a public service announcement um, as a billboard in a bus shelter. And it said, ask your friends about their mental health. It can help. It struck me as unusual, a message of a sort I hadn't seen before, certainly not as a billboard, but then I started hearing and reading an increasing number of stories talking about mental health in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today on Beyond the Standard. Beyond the Standard is produced by Accreditation Commission for Healthcare. ACHC supports quality improvement and patient safety by offering education and accreditation services that span the continuum of care. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent official policy or positions of the company or companies with which the participants are affiliated. Today, we're talking about the relationship between COVID-19 and mental health. There's already a lot of data being collected on this relationship, and I'm sure we'll see many papers and studies with analysis of that data in the coming years. But I wanted to start with one example of a public-facing resource from a healthcare organization. Massachusetts General Hospital has added to its website a guide to mental health resources for COVID-19. And in the introduction, they write, The unprecedented circumstances surrounding the emergence of COVID-19 have created a great deal of stress and uncertainty for patients, families, communities, and healthcare providers. A little later, I'll be joined by Ken Goodman, a licensed clinical social worker specializing in anxiety disorders, to talk about how he's seeing that stress and uncertainty in his clinical practice. But joining me now to discuss the particular experience of healthcare providers is Erica Schneider, Chief Nursing Officer and Vice President of Patient Care and Operations at Soin Medical Center and Kettering Health Green Memorial, both part of the Kettering Health System in Ohio, which is accredited by HVAP. Thank you very much for your time today, Erica. Can we start by putting your organizations in some context? Can you tell me as the nursing leader for your orgs, how many nurses are you working with? Yeah, so at those two facilities, we have about 550 nurses. Okay, so it's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you walk me through your organization's experience from the beginning of the pandemic? And I'm I'm particularly interested in in the impact on your your nursing staff. Absolutely. And um, I appreciate being able to tell the story. And as I tell some of the things that happened to us, um, I know that this reflects many organizations across the nation. uh, As I've talked to colleagues that they've seen similar Uh, things happen in their hospitals. Mm -hmm. So if I go back in time to March of last year, um, early March, we started to hear things were happening on the West Coast. And uh, for any of those who are, you know, from the West Coast, I think they really uh, helped us pave the way. We would reach out and, you know, hear the stories of what they were dealing with, which helped us have a little bit of time to prepare. And then all through the summer, we had, you know, it would up and flow up and down. We sort of learned a little bit more about COVID. Um, some of the things we thought we needed, we didn't need. And some things we were like, oh, we need more. Uh, even masks and things like that. Really, I'm proud of our, our material management team, how they started resourcing around the world of trying to stay ahead on the PPE and make sure we had what we needed, which was a very good thing. Because come October, November, we went from about 70 patients to 263 patients. And so it was almost four times the amount of patients that we had been taking care of. And so that surge was really, um, it almost was overwhelming in moments of how many patients were coming in uh, at a time. And one of the ripple effects, uh, about 40% of my larger hospital at one point was full of COVID uh, beds and patients. And so we went from, you know, a few to 40% of the beds had COVID patients. And with that, we had team members, when you talk about the mental health toll, we had team members who, you know, thank goodness had been taking care of these patients for a while, but you kind of start to see an ebb and flow of the work and what's, you know, the resources and what's occurring on your shift. And then when November hit that surge, I, it became like, I, that, that flow is no longer going to work for the, the amount of patients that we had. 
Um, we had a couple units that uh, had typically taken care of healthy cardiac patients that we turned it into a COVID unit. That entire unit was full. And many of the nurses who worked there had never experienced um, a patient die before. Uh, the majority really? of them, yeah, the majority of their patients were healthy, uh, cardiac, coming in for a test or a rule out or you know being worked up for future um, diagnostics. And the again, these these staff members said, yes, I will do this work. I'll I'll accept this calling. And they had no idea uh, of what that would take. So we lost a lot of patients, unfortunately, to the illness there. And so with that, just the emotional toll that it took on the staff, uh, we had chaplains come in and different people uh, work with them, uh, but they would go home. And, you know, I, I guess, Angela, the other part that's really sad when I talk about going home is a lot of them would stay way away from their family. They would sure. be afraid to, you know, even though they're changing clothes, they're using proper protocols, they're being as safe as they can be. Uh, the fear, the public was very afraid, families were very afraid, and then they have children or grandparents in their home, and so they would stay isolated, which furthered uh, just that stress toll on the team. So at work, it's stressful, and then normally to go home, you have that um, support system who helps you de-stress, and you talk about your day, and that was not as full uh, as it had been. So we worked on ways to, you know, help support them with uh, therapists to come in and, and, you know, just do little things, but um, things that would try to support them so they could be heard and listened to. And I think one of the other things that was eye-opening to me, and I, you know, I hate to admit it, but I was kind of taken aback, is that some of the nurses didn't even come to the sessions that we provided for them because they had a hard decision to make. Um, do I stay for this session and, and take care of myself? Or do I go home and take care of my family? Uh, at the same time, you know, school's not in session. And so they are teacher, their mother, their dad, uh, their parent, um, spouse, all of that. And so it just really hit me that this is going to take a very long time for our team to really get the, the, the support and the help that they need um, to process what all has occurred to them. We've all heard that maxim of, you know, put your own mask on first, and it is so difficult to do. And, and what I'm hearing you say is it is particularly difficult for healthcare providers. Um, so I'm wondering, were you able to model self-care or, you know, what, what did the leadership do to encourage people to take care of themselves? Mm, that's a great question. Probably not enough in the beginning. Uh, when we were all working so hard, unfortunately, we can model behavior that people then cascade down. Uh, we realized quickly that that is, we're going to burn out our staff. We had a couple of our ICU team members uh, reach out to their leader, who then reached out to me and immediately went right to my heart that they were needing time off. They were needing uh, additional support and uh, being away from work. Uh, they would have nightmares about uh, the alarms and not being able to get to the patients. And as I read that, I it went right to my heart of we have to do more. We have to be, we have to do better. Mm -hmm. um, so we worked with, if you need time off, take time off. Uh, even though we were drastically short personnel, we had a lot of our own staff get COVID. <clears throat> Excuse me. Really? Yeah, at one point we had hundreds of our staff out on quarantine or being positive. So they're either being worked up that they were exposed, uh, you know, in the community or, uh, you know, possibly had it uh, themselves. And so we, we had that double squeeze of not enough staff, but we also need you to be off and be whole. And so the, the managers worked on a plan to cascade and figure out like who can come and help support the nurses so it was fantastic. The organization had all of these people who had been, a lot of people who had been furloughed um, or working from home. And so they put out a request. Uh, we're, we're a large network. And so they put out a request and said, hey, who can come in and be an extra hand for the nurses, uh, for the techs, for respiratory, for EBS, for anyone who could come and support? 
overnight, I think it was like a hundred volunteers that said we will wow. come and help uh, do whatever is needed. So we made a list of everything they could do to help support the nurse again, so that people can take time off. And then the, the people that are here uh, aren't just doing more work, you know, instead of the four to five patients, now you have seven or eight, that just doesn't work for the patient or mm-hmm. for the nurse, but to have this person become an extend and be like an extra hand to them. So we had that them come in and help them. And then I would say in November, December, when it is really, um, we were in that high surge, we started to really make sure the managers were taking time off so that they were role modeling for the nurses to take time off. And, you know, the studies show when you're not physically or mentally at your best, you make more mistakes. That's and right. We did not want to have just that downward spiral of care for the staff or for the patient. Of course. We definitely, um, we, we met early this year. Uh, again, January was still um, a high, you know, high volume of COVID patients. And so the nursing leaders all met across the company uh, with our HR leaders and just really did sessions on listening to what has occurred in the hospital and how do we help. Because if you were furloughed or if you're working from home, you really could not see what was happening. You could hear the stories or you could hear from your friends, but unless you see it, you really don't understand the full impact of that feeling. And I heard this from many nurses. The feeling that I came to work today to do my best and I couldn't do my best. Oh, that's heartbreaking. It is. It was. Or I came to work to heal and, you know, help people get better. And they felt like it became at moments um, very, very difficult to do that. So they would leave and go home defeated, even though they're doing heroic work. So that Mm -hmm. was the signs that we have got to have. So we had um, about 140 agency nurses to come in uh, and help support so our, our staff can, you know, have their time off, uh, do what they need to do, again, because many of them were also teaching at home and just trying, trying to do double duty with their family. Um, so we, we did that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Let me ask you this. In, in my community, um, early on, when everyone, w- when we were in lockdown and everyone who could work from home was working from home, um, you know, at, at eight o'clock every night, everybody would throw their windows open and and make a lot of noise and bang pots and pans. And this was intended to be in support of essential workers. And, yeah. and I live in a neighborhood where there are several hospitals. Um, and so w- there was a real focus on them. And I would go out for, for a walk every day. And when I would walk past the hospital, there was a lot of signage that said heroes were Work here and um, and and it was very moving and meant a lot to those of us who are not healthcare professionals. But I I always kind of wondered, did it have any impact? Absolutely, like a hundred percent. Yes, a hundred percent. We had, especially in the beginning, I would say the uh, I hadn't heard of the pots and pans. I love that idea too. Uh, in the beginning, we had a lot of support, like people would drive up and, you know, hold up signs. Uh, we would have family members who are out in the parking lot because, again, no visitors were allowed. They would hold up signs for hours of support for their family member and also the team. And so right. just that love of the community and the love for healthcare workers, um, I, I know that they, it made a big difference to them. One of the things, Angela, we have talked about is that this is not going to be done for a long time, even though our COVID numbers right now are in the 20s and we're so thankful Uh, every day. That's the first thing I look at every day. And I thank God for that every day. Uh, But we know the emotional, mental toll that this has taken. It's going to take a long time um, to process for the team, for them to feel like you you, there was nothing you could have done different. This was not about your skill. It wasn't about your commitment. It wasn't about your ability. It was sheerly this disease and what we had to do to fight against it. I know that many people feel that guilt of I should have done more. And so we're working with them as, as a whole company. Of we, we think this could take a year or two to really, you know, support, help, you know, de-stress their environment, allow different ways for them to uh, process and recover. 
Mm -hmm. I know we've done many things we haven't done enough. I think you're probably very accurate in saying that it's going to take some time. Um, it, it interestingly, um, Ken, with whom I'm speaking a little bit later, some of what he's seeing is is um, people who have been working at home who now feel anxiety about things being quote unquote normal again. Um, you know what what does that look like and what does that mean? And given that it you know we can't see a virus. We, we are, now we can't unsee it in a way. Um, so, so true. Many of our staff have been vaccinated. You know, back in, I think, November, December, we started getting vaccinated. But I still see the fear of people who have been fully vaccinated. They're still wearing masks. They're still very protective. And we're very supportive of that because of the anxiety. I do think we'll be more cautious on even how we socially distance people in the hospital and how we think about how we, you know, transport you or how we protect you because the public is still very, you know, degrees of fear of if I come into the hospital, am I going to be safe? And so really making sure, you know, we, we, we verbalize our care more now. We say, Hey, I'm going to do this for your safety. Hey, I'm washing my hands because I want to keep you safe. Uh, those things that we normally would have silently cared for you, we want to make sure we narrate the care so that the, the public knows, our teammates know. And I also am reaffirming to myself that I'm trying to keep you safe. I'm also going to keep myself safe. Um, no shortcuts and things like that to keep um, you safe. So there's been a lot of positives. You know, again, it's hard to, it's hard to say those words, but I do think and just seeing the community of healthcare come together in ways I hadn't seen before. Physicians, nursing, everyone was really, um, that emergency preparedness that you talked about, it was at a level that, you know, we do lots of drills and we have true emergencies. This was um, on a scale that was very, uh, very impressive. Mm -hmm. Well, Erica Schneider, thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate um, hearing the story of, of how your hospitals um, have experienced COVID, and I hope that all of your staff stays healthy and um, makes great progress in, in recovering from the emotional toll of this pandemic. Definitely. Thank you so much. I appreciate having the chance to tell their story, uh, and we will continue to uh, tell this story as we progress. So thank you. Joining me is Ken Goodman, a licensed clinical social worker who specializes in the treatment of anxiety disorders. Ken sits on the board of directors for the Anxiety and Depression Association of America and is the founding director of QuietMindSolutions.com. Ken is an author and speaker who, in addition to working with private clients, has developed some really interesting resources available to anyone, including a 12-hour self-help audio program called the Anxiety Solution Series, Your Guide to Overcoming Panic, Worry, Compulsions, and Fear, as well as a self-help coloring book. We've put links to his website with these resources and others in the notes for this episode of the podcast. Ken, thank you so much for taking time to talk with me today. Oh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Well, I'm not a clinician, so I hope that you're, you won't mind starting with some really basic questions. No problem. Um, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America says on its website that anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the United States, affecting 40 million adults every year. So while those are, um, I know, clinical terms, they're also terms that we use every day. Um, everybody's got some kind of a baseline understanding of what it is to feel anxious or to feel depressed. And, and I'm wondering if you could speak for a moment about when those things tip over into the realm of something that would really benefit from professional treatment? Yeah, anxiety is a normal emotion that people will experience from time to time. But when it begins to interfere with your life, it interferes with the quality of life, you end up avoiding things, missing things. Um, when it interferes with your job and your family, 
There is regular uh, worries and fears that take place. It's probably time that you seek help. And that can be in the form of medicine, that can be in the form of uh, therapy, but you get a sense that when people, when people who feel like therapy won't help or they're afraid of medicine or they just have never actually done either one of those things, then they don't receive help. Yet 18% of the adult population in the United States suffers with an anxiety disorder and that's pre-COVID. I would imagine since COVID that has gone up. Yep, so you, you teed me up perfectly because I was going to say that um, the CDC recently uh, reported on a study that dates back almost a year now um, in which they found that 30% of respondents reported experiencing at least one adverse symptom associated with anxiety or depression that they specifically related to the pandemic. Um, and that's compared to a, a, the same period a year earlier. And I'm wondering, have you seen this kind of increase in your practice? I have been getting calls from people who specifically have a uh, fear of COVID and how to integrate back into society. So as society begins to open up, they're in a position where they're still sort of trapped in their home, fearful of going out, fearful of getting the disorder, the, uh, the virus, as well as maybe should I get the vaccine or not get the vaccine? Um, and so there definitely are those people. Um, and I think just overall, there's a level of anxiety that's taken place, not just from COVID, but also from um, just the society has changed and it's become more uncertain. And you know, uncertainty, not just with COVID, but also with businesses and their jobs. And so that creates a level of distress. And if their teenager or child is also struggling, they're probably going to be struggling as well. Mm -hmm. So there's an increase of anxiety and stress in all areas stemming from many different reasons. So it sounds like um, the issues that you're hearing about are are less related to the isolation um, or the limitations that people are experiencing by not working in an office or not being able to go out to the movies or do the things that they were doing, you know, a year and a half ago without really thinking about, but but more about the idea of reintegrating um, and re-engaging in the world. Yeah, the anxiety or depression can stem from lots of different areas. So if someone hasn't seen family or friends for a while and they're really working from home, um, there is some anxiety and stress about, you know, coming out. But, you know, if you're more isolated and you're interacting less with people, then there's more opportunity to engage with your thoughts. And oftentimes those thoughts can be dark and scary. And the more isolated you are, the more the, the greater tendency is to engage with those thoughts. And those thoughts can then trigger physical symptoms. People can become depressed, people can become anxious. I mean, we're social creatures. And if we if one of the if someone is a social being and a social person, but now they're isolating for the last year, that's going to have an impact on them. So how do you, let's say you've established a relationship, you're working with a therapist, how, how do you evaluate the, the quality of the treatment? Um, you know, I think we've all seen old, old TV shows or old movies where somebody's been going to their psychiatrist for, you know, years and years and years and years. Um, is that what the expectation should be? No. You do not want to be going for years and years and years. Um, you want to try to deal with whatever it is you're dealing with and then move on with your life. Um, you know, some people can resolve their issues in four sessions and other people it takes a while. Um, I mean, the goal is not to be in therapy. The goal is to is to, you know, you know, have a goal and have a set of goals and accomplish those goals. And but you know, I do get calls from people who tell me that, you know, they have a great relationship with their therapist, they love their therapist, but it doesn't seem to be working. 
-hmm. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're making progress and if not be able to bring that up. And if you're not making progress, there might be a reason why you're not making progress. Part of it might be that the therapist doesn't have an expertise in the area that you are needing help with, but also might be the, the patient as well. The patient may not be following through with therapists' suggestions or um, working with the therapist in a collaborative way. So you have to ask yourself, okay, am, am I doing something that's preventing me from getting better? If you want to resolve something and you want to get better, you know, to be motivated uh, to solve that problem is key. So turning back to um, the topic we started with, the COVID-19, um, I'm, I'm wondering, is there really a silver lining to this in that it has sort of normalized discussion of anxiety and depression? Um, you know, I think that there is still a lot of stigma in our society um, around seeking help for mental or behavioral health issues um, and being able to, we're all in this together. We've all experienced this. And, and I think that even if you haven't suffered, um, you recognize that others have. And mm -hmm. so maybe it's, maybe it, there's some benefit for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that there is more discussion about anxiety and depression and the more people talk about it, the less stigmatized it is. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, there's probably not enough providers out there. Uh, I do understand that, you know, people are trying to get help and they're having a hard time finding therapists. Now, the good news is that because of um, Zoom and other types of um, video conferencing platforms, you can see providers anywhere in your state. So even if you're having trouble finding someone in your town, you can go you know, much further and find someone. Um, prior to this, very few therapists were using telehealth and now everyone is. So even if you live in a rural area, you can search and find people. And then there's a lot of self-help, like the Anxiety and Depression Association of America has a lot of videos and webinars and articles. Um, there's great books out there and, you know, it's not good enough just to read the book. You need to, again, collaborate with the material. Well, great. Well, thank you. This has been really interesting and I appreciate your time so much and oh, um, look forward to talking to you again. Beyond the Standard is a production of Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, providers of accreditation services for a wide range of community-based healthcare providers, including home health, pharmacy, demi-pose, home infusion therapy, behavioral health, palliative care, hospice, and renal dialysis, as well as hospitals, laboratories, and ambulatory surgery centers. Each episode of Beyond the Standard takes a look at an impactful idea for healthcare provider organizations. We're especially interested in those that help organizations improve as they seek to meet the needs of their communities and the patients that depend on them. ACHC is by providers for providers. Before you go, share your feedback by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts and check out our schedule so you don't miss upcoming episodes. For more information about ACHC accreditation, visit achc.org. While you're there, you can subscribe to this podcast and sign up for our newsletters.